welcome to the Father of all, here at uh, Oakland Park at the University of Johannesburg. And I want to just say, I know some of you in the audience who know Dr. Tani Ndlovu, um, Mavis, as we used to know her, I want us to just have a few minutes silence for this amazing, energetic, forever there, forever on the road, forever fixing people's lives, forever giving advice, for being such an amazing person who uh, a, a week and a half ago passed away in a horrible accident. And when I asked uh, my, my, my dear me up there, would she want to say something about Tanya and Global? She said, what about all the others we should be saying something about? But let us use Tandi as an example of a great South African woman who we can all emulate the way she behaved to all of us. And, for the, and have a few minutes silence in remembrance of her. Thank you. So my name is Tanya Adams and I'm your program director for the evening and I'm a member of the Mischief Board. And we're very pleased indeed to have Dr. Nonita Pukuza to give an opening and welcome to our keynote speaker. I hadn't seen Nonita for a long time and she's got such broad experience in academia, in, in the diplomatic world, she was a member of parliament. And now she is a senior executive director in the vice chancellor's office. So she will be giving the introduction to our main speaker and giving us some information about him. But just before she comes on stage, let me just recognize, what is the difficult thing this business of recognizing people in the audience? And you tend to pick your favorite. Uh, so I'm picking Stan Sangweni to welcome him as my favorite person in the room. <laughs> it's a honor it is to have you here, sir. But also here are members of the Johannesburg uh, Executive Leadership Group, University of Johannesburg Executive Leadership Group. Also here, of course, is the chairperson of MISTRA, Professor Sibusis of Como, and various board members as well as governing members such as Lulie and others. This is where you can go get seriously in trouble when you don't pick people. So that's why I'm going to keep it limited to those few. Uh, what we want to recognize though is uh, Archbishop uh, Tavo Mokoba and his wife here in the audience up there. Thank you very much for coming. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, Me Sadele Mbeki, who's also up there, and very pleased that she was able to come. And I think Nolita, uh, when she does your introduction, you might want to recognize others, but I thought I would assist you. So thank you, Nolita. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Abrams. Uh, we are all fired for you not recognizing our chancellor, <laughs> Professor Njabulo Ndebele. Please welcome, Chancellor. <laughs> yes, and of course, uh, I think Dr. Abrams has covered a lot of protocol, so I really don't want to eat into your time by going into that as well. Everybody is quite welcome. So ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good evening. Where's the arch? I didn't see the arch. Oh, okay. Okay. And his wife is my home girl. Hello. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Vice Chancellor, Professor Chilizi Marwala, arrived this morning from China. He came briefly to the office and left for the World Economic Forum, where he will be speaking on the fourth industrial revolution. As you all might know, he is the fourth industrial revolution man. He sends warm greetings to Professor Romano Ishut, 
and has expressed his appreciation to Mistra for organizing this event. He wishes everyone a pleasant evening and a fruitful engagement. The theme and sub-themes, of course, as they normally say when they write, they say Dr. Vuguza is a, or in the case of journalists, uh, is an editor of Sunday Times, but the views expressed here are his or hers. <laughs> so, so this is the case now. The theme and sub-themes of this annual lecture could not be more timeless. It could not be more on point and relevant for where we are both as a nation and as the world. The truth is we are in trouble. We are living at a time where it is difficult to articulate what kind of times we're in. Some have characterized the current era as the age of anger. Others mark it as an age of cold realism, whilst others have remarked about it being the era of geopolitical emotion. Among some of the challenges that our societies confront is the emergence of populist divisive politics that threaten to erode the social order for which people fought over decades. I was watching BBC yesterday when I saw Philip Lee walk out of the Tories to the Lib Dems and he spoke of them being infected with twin diseases of populism and nationalism. The wave of populism that threatens progressive politics is a global phenomenon that affects democracies both in the emerging markets and also among established democracies that we previously thought were immune to such phenomenon. We have seen in the United States a shift from the American ideals of freedom and opportunity for all towards a political order that is based on exclusivity where citizenship is defined with an aim to dehumanize others. We have seen also the idea of citizenship in the European Union under scrutiny as the right-wing populist elements see inclusivity as a threat to their survival. Walking away from ideals of unity and cohesion has become common thread and a common threat in those democracies. Apart from the turn towards populist nationalism in the US, a wave of authoritarianism and nationalism blew across the Philippines, Turkey, and parts of the Eastern Europe. This is in addition to the resurgence of populist, nationalist, and alternative right-wing parties in France, Germany, Italy, and Hungary. And here, in our polity, we are also confronted with the same wave of populism that is threatening our long-held principle of consensus-driven approach in resolving our challenges. In all of this, we need to ask ourselves what needs to be done to rescue our democracies from divisive politics. We cannot accept that this populist wave is a new normal that we have to contend with. The key question for me is how we reinstate the legitimacy of consensus politics based on common destiny for our nations. Of course, this cannot be asked with, with uh, this cannot be asked while ignoring the issue of inequality in our society. So, against this background of receding U.S. leadership and fracturing Europe, can the BRICS offer an alternative normative framework? It is against this question that I welcome and ask Professor Romano Ishut to share with us his reflections on what happened and how do we get out of the age of unreason and ignominy? Professor Schutt. Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor <clears throat> to be invited to deliver this annual lecture, 2019. Special thanks to my friend Joel it's also uh, always very nice to meet old friends like Ed Webster, Professor Ed Webster, and to meet new, new ones. 
I have worked for many years as trade union advisor and during the first decade of this century occupied positions in public administration, among which in the presidential office during the first term of Lula. Over the last 30 years, I've also been in regular contact with South Africa, organizing exchange, exchange programs and participating at several kinds of meetings and conferences in your country. There was always an optimistic mood of mutual respect, inspiration and encouragement. Although very different, there were a lot of similarities in the struggle for a democratic and inclusive society with decent jobs, income and wealth distribution. We were able to learn from our conquests and move forwards together. This cross-identification was present in the relations that were established within the Kut and Kosat and would express later on in the India-Brazil-South Africa initiative, IPSA, and also in the strong support from Brazil to include South Africa in the BRICS. Some years have passed since the last time I visited South Africa, which was in 2013, on the occasion of a conference on the Lula moment for South Africa, which resulted in a publication with an article of mine. The diagnosis was that Lula had started carefully in the first administration and made strong progressive steps in the second. Who knows, was the idea, Zuma could make a similar kind of jump during the, his second term. My message was again of cross-optimism. I suggested not only Zuma, but also Dilma could and should have her own Lula movement, mo moment in her second term, which would start 1st of January 2015. Unfortunately, we saw neither of this happening for several and different reasons. I do not feel qualified to comment on the dynamics in South Africa, but will focus, I think the additional value of my speech is to understand yeah, the, and to try to give an answer to a question which crossed the minds of progressive people all over the world. What the hell happened in Brazil? <laughs> Why, instead of an inspiration, the country becomes a motive of despair? Since I got the inv invitation, I thought a lot about the way I would give, try to give an answer to this question. I decided to use a four-level approach. The first level, the international constraints and opportunities. The, third, the second, the level of internal production structure. The third, the class and social relation. And the fourth, the level of ideas and values. On the international constraints and opportunities, I will divide in two parts, the economics and the politics. Economically, Lula was a lucky guy. The same year he began his term, prices of practically all commodities in Brazil that Brazil exported went up. So we could make our life simple and make a three-minute presentation to explain what happened in Brazil. The windfall profits from exports of commodities gave Lula the possibilities to finance popular programs and then when Dilma was re-elected in October 2014, prices started to fall, unemployment started to rise, the PT's popularity uh, declined, people got frustrated and voted an aggressive right-wing candidate. The Liberals would add to this that the fall in commodity prices would show the incapacity of the left to run the economy. However, this would be vulgar and not very nuanced analysis, although there is some basic truth in it. The wave of progressive governments that were voted all around South America were a reflection of a neoliberal policies that did not deliver. And of course, the rise in prices of commodities, the fortuna, was crucial, but so was the virtue. To put this wealth at the service of the poor was a political decision which had to be, this has to be credited to progressive policies conduced in the case of Brazil by the PT governments. Now, these pro-poor policies were made possible without attacking privileges because of the boom in export prices. And there was also a link with China's demand, which explains the, the increase in these prices. As the economy was growing, and the Lula administrations implemented several pro-industry policies, there was not yet a problem with increase in Chinese man manufacturing imports in Brazil. The far-reaching impact of the 2008 crisis would change this, although its real impact would be felt only a couple of years later. 
We had first a short six-month crisis after the Lehman Brothers collapsed, but in March 2009, the economy started to stabilize again, and in 2010, we had 7.5 increase in GDP. Lula argued that a thunderstorm in New York had produced just small waves in Brazil. However, the post-2008 world would be different and not so friendly anymore. When Dilma came in, her Ministry of Economy would speak about a financial tsunami. The Fed's quantitative easing had increased liquidity in the markets. Brazil had no capital controls. These were taken away in the 90s, and Lula administration hadn't seen the need to reintroduce them. High growth figures with income distribution and structural high interest rates made Brazil, for different reasons, very attractive as a destiny for part of this liquidity. This provoked a new round of appreciation of the local currency. However, by then, the margin to absorb these flows without heavy costs was gone. From two real per dollar, when Lula came in, now Dula had to, Dilma had to face 1.5 real per dollar in 2011. That makes import of manufacturing too easy and invest in local manufacturing not very attractive at all. So industrialists became importers. There was another component to this. The post-2008 economy resulted in a slowdown in the demand in the main markets, which provoked increase in competition. China was determined to keep his, its growth figures and started to become more aggressive in the international markets, with huge impacts in Brazil, but also in other South American markets, exactly the markets which were export destinies of Brazil manufacturing. The world economy would go through a new round of rivalry, is going through a new round of rivalry, with China challenging the US and the later looking for ways to keep its leadership. One battleground is the so-called Fourth Industrial Revolution, which will change the way production and distribution is organized. Brazil, which considered itself at some point in 2010 a natural leader of a South American bloc as part of an effort toward a more multipolar world, found itself faced with the brutal reality of being a peripheral country. In international politics, Lula started to make a change in an earlier stage. This had to do in part with the realities that his government was faced with right from the beginning in 2003. First, the invasion in Iraq, just a couple of months after he took office. He reacted by starting, by starting with the presidents of France and Chile in international action against hunger and poverty, backed by Kofi Annan as an alternative to war. Secondly, Brazil had to position itself in the Doha round in the WTO meeting in Cancun, also in 2003. It ended up leading a group of 20 countries, among which South Africa, that would not accept the usual dictate of the US and the European Union. Soon, Brazil's foreign policy became incredibly active and innovative, projecting the country on the international scene with multiple initiatives like the IPSA. So far, so good. The US, US administration might not have liked Brazil's new policy approach, but Lula himself invested a lot in maintaining a dialogue with the US and with Bush in particular. Lula presented Brazil as a reliable interlocutor. This changed. However, when Brazil dared to engage with Iran, it's a complex story, but in 2010, Lula, together with Turkish leader Erdogan, started direct talks with Ahmadinejad. Although at some point stimulated by Obama himself to do so, once Lula, to everybody's surprise, managed to negotiate a deal on the nuclear issue, Hillary Clinton, the deep state, and Israel were furious. Brazil had gone, in their eyes, one step too far. Thanks God, they thought, Lula was leaving office and the US would invest a lot in President Dilma in the beginning, offering her a state visit, something Lula had never been given. However, Dilma reacted strongly once it became public that the US was hacking her mobile phone and also spying on Petrobras, the state oil company who had found huge amount of new oil reserves. She canceled the state visit. And then, although she was not very interested in foreign policy at all, she invested a lot in the BRICS, not exactly a pro-American partnership. 
She had already upset the foreign relations establishment in the US in 2012 when the coup was produced with support of the US to overthrow President Ferdinando Lugo in neighboring Paraguay. Dilma, react, Dilma reacted immediately by allowing Venezuela to become a member of the Southern American Common Market, Mercosur. The US did not like that at all. But there was more. In 2007, Brazil had discovered these gigantic oil reserves. And in December 2010, the laws regulating exploration and production in these areas were changed, giving strong preference to Petrobras at the expense of foreign companies like Exxon and Chevron. I consider these new laws one of the most courageous acts of Lula administration. And he was only able to get them through Congress in 2010 because of the enormous popularity he had gained over the years. We know now, through WikiLeaks, that these companies, Exxon and Chevron, were very active in trying to block these new laws and once they were approved, in undermining them. Dilma was even more keen on giving priority to set up national production change around the offshore oil. Lula himself has said in all the interviews he gave, gave over the last three years that the US interests in the oil reserves are for him a key understanding, to, a key to understand the so far basically invisible movements that undermined Dilma's government and put the pro US and pro market government in place. In any case, there is no doubt that the US government that was able to coexist in a constructive way with Lula government till 2009 started to have strong reasons to help to undermine and later celebrate the overthrow of the elected government. I have to mention also the strong involvement of Dilma in guaranteeing the success of the 2014 BRICS meeting in Brazil with the setting up of the new development bank and the contingency reserve arrangements. This was just after Putin administration had annexed Crimea. What we can conclude so far from this is that there were powerful forces not really interested in Brazil occupying in an autonomous way a strong position in world politics. And the PT may have underestimated these forces. Now, second, on the constraint of the international production structure. Contrary to most other Latin American countries, Brazil had been able to build up a diversified industrial park, including capital goods. In 1980, industry accounts for 26% of GDP. Debt crisis, neoliberal policies provoked over the following two decades a process of what is called precautious deindustrialization. So when Lula came into office, participation of industry in GDP had dropped to 14%. And much worse, Brazil had missed the third industrial revolution. Lula defended a multiple, multifaceted approach. First, the agro-business should not be seen as a problem, but the government would set up policies to boost also the smallholders. Second, Brazil would continue to support agricultural production and export, but needed also a strong industrial basis. And third, Brazil should at least try to build up an indigenous and technological infrastructure. Part of this would be the heavy investments in federal universities, but also in specific high-tech military projects, like nuclear-driven submarines and using acquisition of Star Wars for technological transfer. This is particularly curious, seeing the surprisingly strong, aggressive, anti-Lula sentiment among the militaries later on. Government procurement policies, local content requirements, Credits from the state development banks, among other instruments, were mobilized in this effort. And it looked like it was going well. Cross fixed capital formation went up and came close to 20% of GDP, still very low, but increasing. Participation of industry increased from 14 to 18%. Petrobras, the BNDS, and the state banks were giving the task to lead this process. And at the beginning of the second term, Lula would announce the Growth Acceleration Program, PEC. That was a powerful and symbolic framework for a new development phase, central to the pact were the investments in infrastructure. The goals for these infrastructures were set very high. Over the years, a growing frustration of the lack of process arose. Enormous delays 
went hand in hand with heavy cost increases. How to explain this? Common sense would argue that corruption is the main answer to this question. Radical NTPT liberals would even argue that the government had elaborated this project in order to practice corruption. The insistence in corruption by the PT government was not invented by the extreme right of Bolsonaro. It was almost daily exposed, especially after 2012, by the liberal mainstream media, in particular the TV, radio, newspaper, and Monopoly Global. For sure, there was corruption running all over the construction works. But this does not explain at all the problems faced. Neither does it make sense to speak about incompetence of the PT government. We can see similar problems in states like Sao Paulo, governed for decades by liberal-oriented governments. So what was the problem? We have to understand the double process of democratization and neoliberalism. The crisis that created the condition to end the military dictatorship also disorganized the developmental state. That was the liberal trick. People want to get rid of the authoritarian authoritarian state and the liberals put the development state in the same basket. So there were widespread of support to create a lot of control mechanisms around the executive. And these were expanded over time, gaining more independence and more power. In fact, it was the left that always defended this while in opposition. And in government, it was the Lula administration that reinforced the structures and independence from the federal police investigation to the public prosecutors and many others. The problem is that it's got out of balance. The capacity of the developmental state had been eroded by decades of debt crisis, followed by decades of neoliberal policies. So when the PEC had to be put in place on track, there were more engineers working for the control mechanisms than for the Ministry of Transport. This combination of a weak implementation capacity on, the hand, on one hand and a powerful control mechanism created an anti-developmental mentality. So a public employee would prefer not to involve himself, not to sign anything, rather than risking being involved in some process and having to respond to all kinds of supposed irregularities. And guess what? All this did not prevent at all large-scale corruption from taking place. It's very common on the left to defend more state interference in the economy. The problem is, what kind of state do we need? Now, looking back, I would argue the administration, in a way, subestimated the lack of implementation capacity. Imagine someone who wants to run the marathon, but has not, has not been active for years. He has the will, but not the power to reach the finish. The solution should have been the building up stronger state capacity. For this, you need a long-term view, like China's experience shows us. However, the discourse that prevailed was to blame corruption. And to fight corruption, the argument is you have to diminish the state. And one more component of the developmental effort were these offshore oil and gas. As I mentioned, in 2007, Petrobras discovered huge oil and gas reserves at the coast of Brazil. The decision was made to use these discoveries not just to increase government rent. The offshore production was seen as an opportunity to boost national industries. The demand from Petrobras would be enormous and stretched over a long period of time. There was, of course, a trade-off between importing equipment faster and cheaper from Asia or building up national production capacity, which would take more time and, especially in the beginning, might be more expensive. The PT administration opted for the later. The speed of the exploitation would be determined by the capacity of local industry to guarantee the necessary supplies. So, for example, the whole shipbuilding industry that had gone away would be reconstructed, not only for oil tankers and support boats, but also for drilling and production trend platforms. This is medium-term policy. Now, it takes between eight and 10 years between the discovery of oil and full production. In the meantime, the demand for petroleum products had exploded because of the economic growth and income distribution, which means more import of petroleum products where Brazil showed high rate of indebtedness. Easy to criticize. It was even suggested that the whole story of the oil and gas world had been just one more of Lula's megalomania. Megalomania. The anti-Lula forces knew that if Petrobras would succeed, it would give political capital to the PT for many years. So undermine Petrobras would be essential. The opposition was lucky. By the end of 2014, international oil prices dropped and the company lost in value. 
At exactly the same time, the corruption scandal against Petrobras became daily news. So it was very easy to mix up the impact of the sharp drop of oil prices with the loss that one could credit to corruption. With the attack on Petrobras, one stone would kill several birds. First, it was a symbol of state intervention and state-led development. Second, the so-called almost bankruptcy of Petrobras was explained by corruption, mismanagement, and wrong policies of the PT. So solution, get rid of the PT, reduce drastically the role of Petrobras by privatizing its subsidiaries, and open up for international capital, which would be more efficient and faster. The liberals would even use the in environmental argument. We need to export the oil and gas as fast as possible because very soon there will be no demand anymore. So there is no time to build up local capacity. All in all, the first Dilma government was not a disaster at all. The international environment had become complicated, but she was determined to defend the jobs of the workers and their salaries. Even with the economy slowing down, she would keep significant increase in minimum wage, for example. She would defend Lula's legacy at all costs. This led to an increase in public debt and wrong public policy price policies. The BNDS, the State Development Bank, was used at full speed to keep dynamics in the economy, and the Treasury would put in the funds. These policies were short term and would not be possible to maintain them over a long period. In 2015, after the re-election, she decided to take one step back by adopting restrictive economic measures, which would immediately increase unemployment by millions. The liberal opposition started to criticize the whole idea of the BNDS as a tool to defend and boost the economy. It was suggested again that public financing was used for corruption and to finance left-wing governments in Venezuela and Cuba. Two weeks ago, Nobel Prize winner Joseph Stiglitz published an article in one of the main papers of Brazil defending the BNDES and explaining how important it is for countries like Brazil to have public finance for long-term projects, as private banks only engage in short-term. Look like the financial sector in China. Last but not least, we can identify a lack of coherence between the industrial policies on the one hand and the macroeconomics on the other. And this has to do with the decision taken by Lula at the beginning to not attack the powerful financial sector. Interest rates and exchange rates were left to the markets. You will not be able to find any comments from Lula on these two basic macroeconomic prices. Brazil would continue to be among the world ivory leak in interest rates and not introduce capital controls. Due to the very specific conditions during the Lula government, this was not a problem. But for Dilma to continue to defend jobs and workers' income, she started to interfere in both interest and exchange rates with little success. And that brings me to the third level of analysis, the class and social relations. There's a discussion in the left in Brazil about when the coup that led in May 2016 to the overthrow of Dilma started. The question, in my opinion, relates to another one. How did the different fraction of the ruling class and the upper middle class react to the election of Lula in 2002? Here I would I'd like to refer to the concept of counter-revolution as used by Walden Bello in his recent publications. The ruling classes have many ways to react to real or potential threats to their privileges, not limited to the use of brutal force, although all options are always on the table. One option is cooptation, corruption, engagement, compromise, to give a small part of the cake to be able to keep the bulk and more important to keep the control of the bakery. So my view in this case, the counter-revolution started mid-2002 when the polls showed a real possibility for to win the elections. The financial markets voted in advance by transfer capital out of Brazil, like they're doing now in Argentina. Country risk went up, like did the US dollar, from 2.3 to 3.5. Message was clear, and Lula reacted by raising the white flag a couple of weeks before the election with a public and written declaration known as the message to the Brazilian people. It was actually aimed at the national and the international financial markets and committed the government to respect of all contracts. No doubt, for some on the left, the message meant watering down PT's historical mission. But Lula showed his understanding of the quote, quote misattributed to the saint of the poor, Francis of Assis. Lord, Lord, grant me strength to change the things I can. The serenity to deal with the things I cannot change. And the wisdom 
to know the difference. <laughs> the idea was, however, that by changing the things you can, new strength is given, new power relations develop, and what yesterday needed the seniority to accept might be possible to change tomorrow, the Lula moment. <laughs> now Brazil, historically, has huge income differences and concentration of wealth. It was one of the last countries to give up slavery, and the race issue is very present in the pattern of class domination. Historically, the political and social basis of Lula were industrial workers, especially in the formal and unionized sectors, progressive middle classes, intellectuals, and part of the Catholic movement inspired by the liberation the theology. Brazil had become a highly urbanized country, more than 85%, but large parts of the population in urban population is in the informal sector. Among the poor, identified as having family income up to three minimum wages, Lula did not win the election in 89, 94, 98, and not even in 2002. But they would guarantee his victory in 2006 and the elections of Dilma 2010, 2014. By putting the poor in the budget and, the, and on the map, he got strong support among these classes. Some describe this phenomenon of Lula winning the support of the poor as Lulism, something that could be compared with Peronism. This had also regional implications as the poor regions in the Northeast started and continued to support Lula. It's in these regions that the PT won four governors in the last elections, while being massacred in the South and the Southeast. The elite has always been extremely authoritarian, and the upper middle class determined to live like the upper middle class in the US and Europe. Now, that, to make that possible, they need to appropriate a much higher percentage of the national income than their counterparts in the high industrialized world. So huge income inequality is being reproduced constantly, following a logic that is very profound, rooted in social, race, and economic structure of the country. Lula decided to operate carefully in this minefield. The most powerful fraction the ruling class, if the ruling class is the financial sector. Lula signaled to them immediately after his first election that, and to their surprise, that he would not attack their privileges. In exchange, they would let him alone in using state banks to implement his policies. Part of this compromise was not imposing capital controls and not interfering in the interest rates. The president of the central bank during the Lula government was someone of the private sector who had been president of the Brazil subsidiary of the Bank of America. The financial sector even started to see opportunities in credit lines for the poor, for example, in student loans and housing sector. This compromise worked during the two Lula administrations, although, of course, heavily attacked by the radical left. But Dilma understood under the circumstances she had to face that it was not possible anymore to defend jobs and workers' income without attack, attacking at least part of these privileges. In 2012, she pressed Opelin for a reduction of basic interest rates, and after that she called publicly for the banks to diminish their world record spreads. This was seen as a declaration of war. And the financial sector started to understand they had to get rid of this woman. At the same time, Dilma boosted, as said before, the state bank to, limit, to the limit with funds from the Treasury. In 2009, Lula had used increase in public credit to fight the impact of the global crisis, but now with Dilma it seemed to become a permanent new policy. As I have explained already, the US started to see Dilma as a problem. Now the financial sector start, shared this view. Let us look now to two other main fractions of the ruling class, agro-business and industrial bourgeoisie. As I said before, Lula didn't see agro-business as a problem in itself. On the contrary, he continued to support it, a sector composed of big landowners who hardly pay property tax, but are responsible for expressive trade surpluses. The compromise with the agro-business was that an exchange of full support, credit lines, opening up export markets, support for ethanol, they would have to tolerate Lula's policy to boost the smallholders. There would be literally two ministries, one for agro-business and one for smallholders. However, crucially, the government would not allow savage agro-business, which means strong and successful measures to reduce illegal deforestation. 
and also strong measures against working conditions considered as similar to bonded or slave labor. It also would mean land reform in non-productive properties and regulation of indigenous lands. Although, of course, the Landless Workers Movement, MST, would mobilize permanently during his government, denouncing too slow and too little land reform. For sure, he reinforced a huge support onto the smallholders and their movements. Agrobusiness would not change their very conservative and authoritarian worldview, but tolerated Lula's governments. In, in, in this field, Dilma didn't change the policies, but nevertheless, the sector would be in the forefront of the counter-revolution with heavy support to the right and extreme right. They had tolerated the Lula government, but never gave up their profound anti-popular and anti-democratic positions. Third, and more interesting, was the relation with the industrial fractions of the ruling class. While in the other two cases mentioned, it was mostly about neutralizing opposition, here the Lula administration wants to create a real developmental alliance, especially in the case with the construction companies. And the BNDS, the Development Bank, was stimulated to support a kind of national champion strategy. This was in part linked to the supplier's chain around the offshore oil. The relation with these companies had a clearly developmental strategy, strategy, strategy rational. They really became allies and friends, maybe too close friends. These relations were used to guarantee legal and non-legal campaign financing. For the companies, it was nothing new. They had experience in corrupting politicians and parties throughout their lives. But for the PT, it was something new and it would get out of control. But let us have a closer look at the Sao Paulo's powerful Employers Federation. When the economy started to slow down in 2011, they still negotiated with the unions a program to defend industry. And the proposals put forward were taking into account Bardilma. And so she thought she could count on their full support in the three movements she would make to maintain the dynamics in the economy. Forcing a cut in electricity prices, forcing a cut in interest rates, and a moderate devaluation. Surprise? They didn't like it at all. Why would they not embrace the interest rate cuts? They always had complained about high interest rates as legal persons. However, as private persons, their wealth was remunerated by these very high interest rates. And this was also the case of the upper middle class, who put their money in funds which basically would invest in public debt. And as far as the exchange rate was concerned, most of the companies were moving to importing part of their components in the process described as transforming the industrial federation in an import federation. For import, overvaluation of, of the currency was perfect. And maybe more important, as was the case with the other fraction of the ruling class, they did not like at all the increase in state interference in the economy. Where would it end? Remind that in 2012, it was exactly the year of the coup in Paraguay and the entrance of Venezuela in the South American common market. So this altogether made me and many others identify 2012 as a major turning point. This is when the ruling class, with support of the upper middle class, more or less decided enough is enough. She had to go. The movement would be the presidential elections, October 2014. And she, the PT, and Lula had to be under attack on a daily basis. Organized wor workers and the majority of the poor were, st were still firm in supporting the government. Lower middle classes, less so. They had the family income too high to take advantage of the various government programs to support the poor and started to suffer from the slowdown in the economy. <clears throat> we have to mention also the identity struggles that got strong support during the PT administration. Lula had created special ministries for women, one for racial issues, another, and gay rights would also get more attention. Organized groups around these issues would be natural allies of the PT governments. But then, out of the blue, in 2013, mass mobilization erupted all over the country. It was a very complex phenomenon, and it's still highly controversial among social scientists in Brazil. It started as a protest movement against a rise in the bus tariffs, but became a general and diffuse protest movement. 
The extreme right ideologists who support the Bolsonaro government argued that this movement was crucial for the rise of the new conservative forces. The so-called June movement coincided with the start of the FIFA Confederation Cup in Brazil. The link between the so-called FIFA standards and the difficulties of government in Brazil, which I described, to get infrastructure and public goods completed was striking and became one of the mobilizing factors. The movement which got support of the mainstream me media was not specifically against Dilma or the PT yet. It was more general against politicians. All of them dropped in the polls. Research showed that right-wing right groups were able to infiltrate through social media much more than the radical left. For sure, the PT, the trade union, and other traditional social movements were caught by surprise. Lula kept silence. Dilma reacted by fulfilling some of the demands that were put forward, for example, the introduction of play bargaining for the case of corruption. This new in, these new in legal instruments would later on be used massively against PT and against Lula. They were introduced by Dilma in 2013. Brazilian politics would never be the same again after 2013. Social media started to play a key role. And as elsewhere in the world, for some mysterious reason, the new right is much better than the left in using these new tools to communicate and send their message out. The June 13 movement had helped a lot in bringing down Dilma's popularity. The problem was that it had increased enormously the opposition to the whole political class. In any case, the ruling class and the upper middle class were still determined to invest heavily in defeating Dilma in the October, October 2014 elections. The main weapon would be corruption scandal around, around Petrobras. On her part, Dilma did not give up and used all the instruments at her disposal to keep unemployment low and defend the purchasing power of the workers. She won the elections. She won the election in October 2014. For the conservative forces, and probably for the US as well, the outcome of the 2014 election was difficult to digest. So the counter-revolution radicalized. She should not be able to govern. Because if she succeeded, Lula might come back in 2018 and be able to re-elect himself in 2022. Not acceptable at all. Undermining the government by any means and destroying the image of Lula was central in the period to October 2014, when Dilma was elected, till May 2016, 16, when she was impeached. Pressure was enormous with daily news on the corruption scandal and attempts to link it directly to Lula. Then Dilma made a terrible mistake. She started her second term with a surprisingly complete different program than the one she had defended during the elections. And she was not able to explain why and how. Basically what she did was to try to implement a kind of structural adjustment program and even this was obstructed by the opposition. The result was chaos and rapidly rising unemployment in 2015. And when the counter-revolution opened up full fire, there were little troops left to defend her. An important factor, which I'll explain in the next and last level of my analysis, is that the campaign against Dilma had no limits. But they did not foresee, what they did not foresee is that a big part of the population would lose confidence in politicians and politics in general. The so-called moderate liberal right, in the sake of getting rid of the PT and Lula, would be willing to undermine democracy itself. The favorite center-right candidate got at the end in 2008 only 4% of the votes. Incredible. Now the last and most interesting part, the level of ideas and values. This is definitely an area where traditional left analysis have to be updated. How to explain, not only the left, by the way, social analysis in general, how to explain the search of a powerful, radical, conservative bloc in Brazilian society, a movement that mobilizes on a daily basis on social media and shows the capacity to organize regularly mass demonstration on the streets, like they did last week. I will take five issues 
Revival of religion in politics. Backlash against liberal value agenda. Neoconservative philosophy. Entering the arena of power problem and the moral issue around corruption and organized crime. Revival of religion in politics. There are radical changes in society which have nothing to do with one or another government, but with changes in the production structure and social relations. Works becomes more isolated, individualized, and connected through platforms. Social media changes habits. However, human beings are social animals. Identity is reflecting not just individuality, but also being part of something. And this cannot really be limited to WhatsApp groups. So while on the one hand, traditional spaces where people would meet in work or leisure are disappearing, on the other hand, there is a search for sociability. The organizations of the left are very much expression of what we would call a fordist kind of social organization and find it extremely difficult to reach out to the people in this rapidly changing environment. On the other hand, the neo-Pentecostal churches have been very effective in filling up the vacuum and give people a feeling of belonging and meaning. They increased enormously over the last 10 years. Bolsonaro understood the potential to transform religion into a political power tool again. Progressive forces had basically no clue what was going on. By now, more than 25% of the Brazilian population is part of one of the many neo-Pentecostal churches. That is more than 50 million people. And this number is still rapidly increasing. Some speak already about 80 million people. For sure, by now in Brazil, although still the biggest Catholic country in the world, there are more people practicing neo-Pentecostal cults Especially among the poor, this is a massive phenomenon and explored very well by Bolsonaro. In the first period of his imprisonment, Lula was not allowed to give interviews, but the Supreme Court gave him permission. So we had over the last months several interviews, and there would always be the question, why and where did the PT make mistakes? And Lula would answer that he's not in prison because of his mistakes, but because of what he managed to do for the poor people. However, in one of his latest interviews, a couple of weeks ago, he admitted that one mistake he definitely made was underestimated the impact and influence of these neo-Pentecostal churches. Third, backlash against liberal values. Since the redemocratization process, mid-80s, the liberal values agenda related to gender, race, sexuality has moved forward. Too slow for the activists, but too fast for the conservatives. However, this has provoked strong backlash. Many people moved away from watching global soap operas, which would show openly gay couples. They would start to assist neopentacle televisions. And one of the main issues used by Bolsonaro to combat the PT was to suggest that the Ministry of Education during the Lula and Dilma government had actively promoted children to become gay. Fake sexual education material was exposed almost daily on television, radio, and social media. To defend family values and prevent, prevent your son or daughter from becoming gay, you had to get rid of the PT. This propaganda was turned into a powerful electoral issue. Bolsonaro himself was always known and continues to be known, now also internationally, as being very of, using a very offensive language when he speaks of gender, gay, or race, including indigenous issues. Somehow, many felt or feel relieved that their values would now finally be respected. Too many people. A shock for the progressive forces, which were not able to respond. Third, neoconservative philosophy. In the beginning of 2016, my son, at the time 15 years old, at high school, asked me if I knew a guy called Olavo de Carvalho. I never had heard of him. He explained that many colleagues at his school were fan of him. I should check out, as I did. Complete bullshit, nonsense. <laughs> Pseudo-philosophy mixed with a lot of very low-level insults to the left and, and, and progressive people. 
I told my son it's not worthwhile, worthwhile to pay attention. Well, I was wrong, completely wrong. The Brazil version of Steve Bannon is by now one of the most influential people in the country, able to press Bolsonaro into the missing ministers, insulting militaries who are not right-wing enough, and setting the tone of hate speeches. He has millions of followers, many young people who think he's a genius. It's simply unbelievable. The guy even suggests openly the world is flat. <laughs> He's a genius. <laughs> the, main enemies, the main enemies for Olavo is globalism and universalism. These forces oppress human emotion and oppose Christian and Western values. He identifies three groups who support the globalist project to, that intends to destroy the Western Judeo-Christian world. And these three, of course, have to be eliminated. Eliminate, that's the words he used. First, Islam but there's no Islam in Brazil. Second, communism, and he sees communism everywhere. And third, positivism and what he calls neoliberal technocrats. And anti-Christian liberalism, represented by people like Obama, Macron, Fernando Ricardoso in Brazil itself. And although this guy lives in the US, every day he sends out messages which are reproduced by thousands and thousands of his followers and influence, as I said, directly the government. By now, Gramsci has become a known person because Olavo has explained that the universities in Brazil are part of a cultural Marxist strategy inspired by the idea of this Antonio Gramsci to destroy freedom and liberty and family values. You have now, now there is a detail in this. You have to understand that if you suggest that Brazil is basically a Judeo-Christian culture, Western Judeo-Christian culture, you completely ignore the Afro-Brazilian and the indigenous presence, which is half of the population. Four important ministers are directly inspired by this nonsense. Education, foreign affairs, environment, and the new ministry that was set up called Women, Family, and Human Rights. These ideas have nothing to do with the legacy of Reagan, Thatcher, or Milton Friedman. Neither with Goebbels, although repeatedly and consciousness use of lies is very present among this new conservative propaganda. For sure, the NTPT mainstream media and traditional center and right-wing parties that had attacked heavily DPT and Lula, especially as we have seen after 2012, did not intend to introduce this kind of worldview. But it is what they got out of it. Curiously, they now argue that it's the PT who has to be blamed for the surge of this thinking. Adrenal adrenalina of power syndrome. People who came out of the social movement and universities start to occupy key positions in the PT government, like myself. <laughs> and they became very much convinced they were carrying out a historical mission. It would be the first time the left was really in the driver's seat. So the logic of the government started to impose itself over the whole movement and the parties itself. Grassroots demands were not taken as serious as they should have been. It's true that Lula's government introduced, for example, a series of thematic local national conference where civil society would debate and present policy proposals. But here I'm questioning the way the resolutions of the conference were dealt with. I would argue there was clearly a lack of humility. Of course, it's important to stress the positive results, but let's take the case of income distribution. Brazil is one of the world champions. Yes, the PT government did indeed go against the logic of globalized capitalism and income inequality was diminished. That's true. However, we would still have very unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory numbers, still behind what one could call civilized income distribution. Another example is the effect of the nominal increase in buying power of the lower classes and the successful policies to formalize informal labor. Great, but this does not create middle classes. The PT propaganda is saying that millions of people were lifted out of poverty to the middle classes was depolitizing. There would be a gap between the 
propaganda of the PT and the difficult situation that millions of people still would face and the profound injustices of the still savage capitalist system. We hadn't built a welfare state, notwithstanding the successful social programs. However, the message was that we were the best. Never before in history a government had done so much for the people. No space for anger anymore. Anger against the ongoing social injustices. Left-wing governments, officials and party leaders felt that they had to explain instead of listening to the people. Five, the moral issue around corruption and organized crime. Apart from the new conservative value issues, which I already talked about, Bolsonaro was very clever in exploring two issues to gain the minds and the hearts of the people. Corruption and crime. Real existing major problems, not like the issues I talked before, the flat world. These are existing problems. In the case of corruption, it was very easy for Bolsonaro because, as explained, the mainstream media over the last five years on a daily basis tried to sell the image of the PT as a corrupt criminal organization and Lula as the most corrupt leader in Brazil's history. Bolsonaro, although for almost 30 years member of parliament, after his troubled career in the military, presented himself as an outsider. And he would end corruption with no pity. The PT's counter arguments that it had done, the, PT, <coughs> the PT's counter argument was that it had done nothing differently than is normal in Brazil since many years illegal financing of election campaigns. That is true. And of course, it's also true that the whole anti-corruption campaign had as a clear goal to put Lula in jail, and if possible, to criminalize the PT. But the use of part of the rent appropriated by construction companies through a cartel that overpriced the contracts with Petrobras to finance campaigns was real and very demoralizing for a party that had originally the end of this logic as one of its banners. Concerning crime, this was never really a use, used in the campaign against Lula or the PT. However, it was a very big problem. People don't feel safe, simple as that. 50,000 people are being killed yearly. That's much more than in most of the war areas in the world. The left always has difficulties to cope with this issue. Because we think by improving social conditions, jobs, housing, education, eh, the problem will disappear or at least drastically, drastically be reduced. Bolsonaro would argue that the protection of human rights was the main obstacle. In a style reminiscent of Duterte, he has spoken publicly that criminals should be crushed like cockroaches. In Rio, over the last months, the number of pe people killed by the police has increased significantly. But not only should police have the license to kill, and punishment have be, has have to be increased, ordinary people should have the access to guns. That became one of his main campaign issues. Another issue is the link between Bolsonaro and the so-called militias armed extortion groups operating especially in Rio. They have become a third force dominating the poor areas besides the organized crime and the military police. Or better, the fourth force, because we have the neo-Pentecostal churches also. <laughs> These militias are set up basically by former police officers. And they, their goal is to gain money. However, if there is any left-wing politicians who goes out in the poor areas to mobilize poor people against the militia, they should, like they did with Mariela Franco. I imagine you heard the city councillor that was brutally assassinated by the militias because she wanted to organize people in shanty towns against the militias. The left has an enormous difficulty to update the scores on this issue and put forward alternatives and, and be able to put forward alternatives to the right-wing solutions, which are much more straightforward and appealing. So now, where are we now? <laughs> the left is isolated, but still very much alive. The center and liberal right 
has lost public support, but is still in control of part of the mainstream media and still has a lot of influence. Now, this extreme right, the government and its allies, they are profoundly and structurally incoherent. We can, we can identify three groups making up the Bolsonaro government. First, the new conservatives around the Bolsonaro clan. Second, ultra-liberals who intend to privatize everything, sell off Brazil to international capital of whatever color, Europe, China, the US, or Russia. And third, the militaries. There are by now more than 250 militaries appointed at several levels in the executive. That's more than was common during the military dictatorship. However, to our surprise, contrary to what we thought in the beginning, the militaries do not seem to have any projects for Brazil, except defending their pension, and pension rights and restoring the image of the military dictatorship as being a democratic civil movement that prevented Brazil from becoming Cuba. So concerning the dynamics of the Bolsonaro government, its contradictions and incoherencies are necessary to maintain the equilibrium between the neoconservative groups on the one hand, and on the one, other, one, other hand, the ultra-liberal wing. The later controls the Ministry of Economy, Energy, Agricultural, Central Bank, and has support of the President of Congress. Contrary to what we see in the US and Europe, the new conservatives in Brazil do not defend at all any kind of economic nationalism. That's very contradictory. And so they speak about nationalism, but there's no content in it. Their appeal to nationalism is empty and based on a simple slogan, our flag will never be red. The ultra-liberal agenda is of course embraced by the ruling class, the upper middle class, and the mainstream liberal media. They know that this agenda does not have any electoral viability in the in democracy of Brazil. So they accept that they have to share the cake with the new conservatives, although they definitely have different values. And definitely most of them are very embarrassed. The new conservative invests permanently in tensions, dailies, Tension to support this supposed threat of communism, which they see everywhere, and the fight against corruption, which keeps the social basis mobilized. One might think or hope that this contradiction would implode the government, but so far it works perfectly. The new conservatives keep the left under a permanent state of attack, while the ultra liberals implement their policies with little opposition. Every time the new conservative rhetoric creates problem for the econ economy, the later the economic groups, the ultra-liberals, manage to force the new conservatives to take a step back. In exchange, they can implement their crazy agendas in other areas that appeal to their bases and dialogues with their campaign promises. Bolsonaro lost support over the last six months, but this has not been translated in increasing support for the left. It seems many people still give him the benefit of the doubt. He's new. He's something that will solve the problem against the, the establishment. It seems many people still give him the benefit of the doubt. So far, the economy has not responded, and unemployment is still very high. Investment record low, and economic growth close to zero. So if this continues, this economic situation continues over the next month in the running up of the municipal elections, which will have a plebiscitarian character, when can, one cannot foresee the outcome. My guess would be that the new conservatives will radicalize. But of course, there are other issues going on, like the victory of the progressive forces in Argentine elections next month. This will have a strong influence in Brazil as well. So I will finish here and take your questions by a samba, a part of a famous Brazilian samba. This goes like this. Recognize the fall, don't get discouraged, get up, shake the dust away, and turn it around. 
The author, George Aragon, said that for him the most essential part is recognizing and understanding the fall. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We were just uh, entranced by the story, and we're glad that we gave you some extra time, I think. <laughs> I mean, the, look, just looking at your biography and the breadth of experience that you've had working in academia at the University of Sao Paulo and uh, advisor to Lula himself over the years, and working in the Research Institute of Applied Economics in Sao Paulo and the World Bank in the region. I, I can understand the amazing story. And I think all of us sitting near each other seem to say, that sounds like us. Yeah. Uh, or it sounds a bit like Trump in some cases, or it sounds like everywhere else. Um, than this. So this part uh, of the of our evening will, will, be, will be managed by Professor Fiona Tregena. Uh, who is a DST NRF uh, South African Research Chair in Industrial Development and a Professor of Economics here at the University of Johannesburg. And she will manage, um, she's got a very long bio, but she's asked me, begged me not to, not to, not to say much, but uh, she's worked with COSATU and universities and UNIDO and UNCTAD and ILO. <laughs> so I think a fitting person to take us through the next part of the evening for any questions. Thanks, Fiona. And, and thanks, Tanya. No, listening to uh, the talk, which was so, so bold, so insightful, so profound, at some points it sounded as though you were talking about our own country. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, um, or to flag, I think, uh, some points from, from your talk, which I thought could have a direct relevance uh, for us in South Africa without putting words into your mouth. Um, firstly, what we call in South Africa the battle of ideas and the importance of that, um, and not only in terms of the media, and that if we fail to exert hegemony, the space will be filled, and uh, probably not by progressive ideas. Secondly, the international domain that you started with, and the importance of strategic alliances and avoiding isolation. Thirdly, the importance of transforming the productive structure of the economy. Um, both South Africa and Brazil during this period have experienced premature deindustrialization. And that it's not enough just to redistribute to gods as important as it is. You've got to transform the productive structure, even though it's, it's difficult. Fourthly, not taking for granted the support of the working class in the broadest sense and the majority, and that if that support is, is lost, uh, there's very little for progressive forces left to stand on. Fifthly, the implementation capacity of the state. You talked about in the case of Brazil, uh, really, it sounded like you were talking about us. I won't say anything more about it. Sixthly, the long-term view. Um, you highlighted the, the contrast with uh, China and the long-term uh, view there as well as the sustainability of, of policies. Seventh, and I guess related to that, um, policy coherence. Um, and you specifically put an accent on coherence between macroeconomic and industrial policy. Um, something close to my heart personally, and I think uh, relevant to uh, very topical debates in South Africa at the moment. And related to that, uh, the role of the financial sector and the enormous power um, that it exerts, um, and uh, how to deal with that. Um, you also talked about corruption and how devastating the effects of um, corruption, whether real or, and or perceived, um, can be. Um, and ultimately, income inequality and wealth inequality, um, an issue uh, central to both of our countries. Um, Brazil has had a lot more success than South Africa in bringing down inequality um, still probably hasn't gone far enough and I think we can expect inequality to quite rapidly rise in, in, uh, in Brazil. Um, in South Africa we're worse uh, and what can we do about that? 
Um, and lastly, uh, relations of capital, which we spoke about. So the complexity and the difficulty of uh, managing, managing capital, disciplining capital, working with capital, regulating capital, depending on capital, uh, and the complexities um, of those relationships. Um, so, you know, we could go on and on, but um, it, it, it really uh, rang so many uh, bells and so much resonance um, with our own case in South Africa and I guess warnings for progressive forces here. So we'll open for, for questions and um, for comments. Um, please keep them brief, not more than one per person. Please briefly introduce yourself and really just keep your, your question um, as succinct as possible because I'm sure there are many people who would like to engage. Uh, hello. My name is Jorge, I'm a PhD student from Peru and I have a question regarding the global or the national Schengen program implemented in 2008 by the Lula government and I just want to know how you explain a left uh, government uh, supporting or supporting the largest capitalists in the country to expand internationally, because that is what it happened. No? Business groups in Brazil, they went international with the state capital, and basically the state financed the international acquisitions of these, kind of, of these companies. And I want to know how do you explain that? Well, a government that is supposed to, to work for the labor, help to concentrate the capital. Just interested in the ideas to be raised around uh, why it is that the Brazilian uh, left was unable to connect in important ways with, with rising Pentecostalism uh, when Brazil has a long history of liberation theology. Uh, they had uh, very important connecting points with Pentecostalism, which is really a religion of the poor in, some, in so many ways. Well, was that a, a lost opportunity to engage and, and uh, like co-opt Pentecostalism into, into the left? In your view, what is the impact of the current uh, Brazilian administration on the functioning well, thank you very much for these questions, very important questions, and of course they're not a straightforward answer, I understand we have different, different opinions for it, but I would say that the government, uh, uh, on the case of national champions, should have been much more aggressive. We are talking about an underdeveloped country, which is huge foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investments, they build the company. They might even help you to export, but they will never build up research and development. It's, they didn't build, it was not foreign direct investment that built up R&D, neither in Korea, neither in China, neither in Japan. So it's extremely important. If a government wants to improve the living standards of its people, which means to overcome underdevelopment and have a development strategy, it's extremely important to fight the financial sector or to control the financial sector, to make allies with the productive sector. Now, uh, and this means with the productive sector to create, not to be against foreign direct investment, not at all. They're welcome in areas which coincides with the developmental program. That was the idea. I think that uh, the, the, the national champion program, for example, was never named like that. You will not find any document of the government or the development bank saying we are implementing a national uh, champion strategy. That is what, how we call it and how the opposition, we in a positive way and the opposition in a negative way. Um, so, uh, the internationalization, by internationalizing uh, Brazilian strong companies, you are fighting spaces, your uh, spaces which are occupied by Western 
European, American, and Japanese big companies. Right? And important is that this policy, in the case of Lula and Dilma, did not at all, did not being, was not at all in contradiction with another strategy, was to put credit for the poor available. So it's completely not true that small companies or poor people, on the contrary, was never so much credit for small companies and, and, and poor people. What happened is that the BNDF simply increased enormously in its activities. And of course there was inspiration of the China and South Korean uh, environment. So that, that would be my response. If, if, if anything went wrong with the national champion strategy, which was very transparent, not at all like is being said. I mean, there was this discussion, why this company, why this, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, uh, we can discuss this. Uh, maybe there were other sectors which we, had, which we should support. But I would say that what was lacking is to convince, to be much more transparent, to explain why we do it, to, to gain the minds and hearts of much more people, uh, that this is a threat, a threat for Brazil to develop, you have to increase productivity. You have to have ways to get out of underdevelopment. We cannot be socialists for the poor with poor policies. So that, that's basically, I understand this is very, uh, there is a lot of criticism in the left on this and I uh, respect, but I have a very clear kind of position on this. Second, uh, well, this is, yeah, the neo Pentecostal. Well, uh, I must say that I started to, to read about it and to learn more and to put my students, I have some students who are of neo Pentecostal churches but are not uh, Bolsonaro, and I asked them to, to, to do research and to follow. We just have very little knowledge. It's completely different than the theology liberation movement. And the, 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 the left redemocratization. The PT was set up in the workers' movement, were set up in part uh, by the uh, uh, Catholic, Catholic movement of the theology liberation. They were crucial in the, this process. Now, uh, so they were involved in struggles where, which were the same, and they helped to create it. Now, the new Pentecostal in the poor areas, they helped to destroy the left wing organizations. Uh, and, for example, there are clear in several cases, but not all. Eh? There are clear cases that are much more, it's much more easy for them to uh, live together with criminalized uh, organized crime. Eh? For example, uh, violence against Afro religion uh, goals, uh, several of them in Rio de Janeiro. So it's a very complex issue. Now, the problem is that uh, we, we, first, the answer we don't know. We don't know what, what happened. Because there were always uh, neo-Pentecostal churches. Why did they grow so rapidly? And why did they become so political? Because in the past, they voted members of parliament just for, in several parties, uh, there would be members of parliament of them. They would come together just for like a law to have tax uh, exemption for their organization. So it was very, that was their politics. Now it's different. They want to defend family values, they say that the left is, is against family values. Eh? And they, they, they are on the forefront. Without their vote, Bolsonaro would never have gone the election. Now, if you look at the votes, of course, I always say, listen, 30% of those who are neo Pentecost and went to vote did not vote for Bolsonaro. And then there is another group who didn't went to vote. So, in total, uh, there are millions of neo Pentecostals who do not identify with Bolsonaro. So, the, the first thing is to recognize that the neo Pentecostal churches are not the enemy of democracy for itself. That many churches are completely manipulated politically uh, and are in the forefront uh, of very undemocratic processes which are going on. So, it's very, uh, uh, we have to identify. Uh, groups or, or parts of churches or whatever to establish it. I mean, there's no future for the left in Brazil if we don't do that. Yeah, that that's, that's for sure. But we woke up too late. We woke up too late. And so that basically, uh, but it's completely different than the, than the Catholic uh, uh, 
theology, theology liberty movement. Um, then the last one on the brakes. Right. So the brakes, as I told, was one of the uh, flag uh, uh, foreign policies ruler after 2008 2009 crisis. And it was through the brakes uh, that, that Brazil had a voice in the G20 that became a, you know, one of the big countries in the world. Um, in the beginning, it, till 2014, the BRICS was more or less to articulate common positions in the G20 and a little bit in the UN, yeah, but it was very important. When the G20 lost its, its, its meaning, its, its, its significance, the BRICS also would have lost it, but then Dilma put an enormous effort, and China as well for different reasons, uh, in starting a new chapter for the BRICS. That was creating institutionality, the new development bank is called the symbol of it. Uh, and that would create new dynamics. Right? Now, the present situation uh, is that uh, Brazil has, of course, uh, not lost its interest of the BRICS because of the importance of the finance of China. That's one of the major contradictions of this government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yeah, like a real new conservative, like Trump, and he says we have to fight China, it's a battle of values, yeah, uh, Bolsonaro before the elections went to Taiwan, yeah, and then yeah, capital, finance and agribusiness said, hey Bolsonaro, we accept you, but not to destroy our interests. We need China for the investments and for the export of agribusiness. So, but, so what it means for BRICS, the political meaning of it, and the political and diplomatical uh, meaning of it has gone. What is left is interest in uh, the financial part. As China is crucial for Brazil's economy, we will not do anything, uh, only in rhetoric, but in practice we will do anything that goes against China. Now we'll have the BRICS meeting in November in Brazil. It will be a low level uh, if, if the we were but anyway. If the PT was in power, it would be completely different because we had oh, we would open the third chapter. Because the issue that is on the table, as you know, all, all uh, BRICS uh, uh, meetings they have a special team. Uh, the special team uh, in 2014 was for Development Bank, and now it would be technology to work together uh, exactly on the issue where the Western world wants to kick the ladder. Uh, so that was a Chinese idea that Brazil supported, uh, and I remember one month before the elections, they came to talk to us, the diplomats, oh, but if you win the elections, because there's still a possibility, uh, do you agree with this? Yes, of course, because it is our idea that was still there on the table to take, pick up technology. Now, Bolsonaro and the Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, they have no clue uh, what BRICS is about, so it's handled by third level diplomats, which are the same third, third level diplomats that were working with us, you see? So th they are moving forward, but it's low level. Uh, so the, the issue of technology transfer to put forward, like we did in the past on uh, HIV, to say, no, we will not pay the, ph the pharmaceutical company, we will use uh, the technology, the, the knowledge that exists to make our own uh, pharmaceutical industry, uh, India and, and, and Brazil, uh, uh, we can do that in many technologies. So it would have been an enormous conference in the planet. And now it will be just, you know, very low level conference. That's how it's. But it will not disappear because Brazil has, it needs the financing of China and it needs China for its export. The role of capital is really, really critical in the development of, of any society. But frankly, obviously, um, the, the interests of capital in any uh, country, any developing country, uh, seems to be at odds with the social development of that particular country. Um, you mentioned in Brazil that uh, President Lula did not criticize or did not go against the interests of, 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 of the capital in that country. Um, and, and so they were able to allow him to, to carry all of his policies. How does one actually uh, rein in or get coerce capital to be able to work in tandem with the developmental strategies of, of, of a particular country. Um, 
because the, the minute you, 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 you legislate, the minute you use any sort of form of, 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 of um, uh, instruments that the government might have, you, you end up with capital flight, or you end up with, um, uh, with, with, with most of the foreign direct investment, uh, fearing that their the interests are not going to be taken care of in that particular country. Um, how does one mitigate, as it were, um, this enormous role and the power that the capital markets or the capital uh, in, in any country has? My name is Tabo Makola. Uh, if you were to be direct, what is your judgment of South Africa? What is holding back building up a bigger coalition movement of the progressive people in mobilizing against these issues of social injustice? Uh, I follow the first part of your, your topic very well, the Asian plan reason and, and, and nominee. But I wasn't sure what the people's judgment was uh, about which you asked whether we could judge it. Okay, let's see. Well, the first, uh, well, Brazil, like South Africa, will be a capitalist country for many years still. So uh, that's reality. And um, what I'm trying to say is that we have he went for definitely to stop about speaking about capital in general and try to identify different uh, different interests. Yeah. Like I would say, Lula was very clever. Yeah. Um, now, what he didn't do yeah, was understand that there is a major problem for development in the third world. A major problem. That's the financial sector. China would never be able to grow. Look at China. 97% of its financial sector is national and state-owned. 97% and there's capital control. Without this, nothing would be possible. Now they're open for FDI, they're open for import, export. It's a, you see? So this is a sector where there's no compromise possible. What I say is that when Dilma started to attack the financial sector in 2012, 2013, uh, what she did not do is to explain it to the people and to have a lot of meetings with other sectors of capital. <coughs> you see? Even agro-business is paying high interest rates. Now what financial sector was able to do was not only to buy the media, which they are in control of the media, literally. Yes. But they also, they created more possibilities for the other sectors of, of, the, of, the, of, of the capitalism to have profits in their, their terms. So if you go, that's why Dilma was surprised. Well, I put interest rates down, and then you are not happy to an industrialist. And this industrialist would say, yeah, but this is my, my private wealth. And it's linked to high interest rates. So you have to, you have to create, uh, uh, you have to be, now I'm completely convinced, we have to be, and that cannot, of course, only be Brazil. And I remind you, for example, that IMF allows in Article 5 for capital control. What, and even, it was the IMF that put out a report in 2011, <coughs> Of Blanchard, or Le Blanchard, which is called managing the capital, managing the capital account. That's beautiful because capital control sounds like something communist. But managing the capital account is very chic. Yeah? But it's the same. They argued that countries like Brazil should have done that. Of course, we, we became. It's it's what happened in Brazil. It's completely open to capital flight in and out. There's no no possibility for developmental policies. It's the main lesson of China. Now, with the other capital sectors, we have to discuss, you have to say, listen, uh, what, what's the future of, you know, you pay a lot of money for private security. Uh, but, I mean, like Lula did, you have to spend a lot, a lot. Dilma didn't speak to anybody, you see? Now, and then to the, to the, to the, uh, the basis, you know, we have to be, yeah, that's the, the, the idea that you're selling out or something like that, if you talk to these people, this is all also to do with 
you know, speaking and, and involving and discussing, and, you see? So I, 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 I insist on this, this issue because uh, uh, the, the, the lack of capital control was fatal for, for Brazil after 2008. And I think it, it's still, it keeps all the development countries permanently in a very insecure situation. Look at Argentina, look at what happened. The Poles, democracy shows the left, center left is going to win. And immediately, there is a complete disaster, capital flight, and so what democracy is this? And now, they are putting capital control, now it's too late. You don't have to put capital control when everybody's running away. Eh? And, and, and so it's become a mess. And when the, when the left, center left is going to win the elections in October, it will be very difficult. Eh? But the idea is you have to, I think, that's, okay, I think I have to be clear. Second, um, on South Africa, well, one of the things that, that surprises, uh, I think, most of the people outside in Brazil, I mean, is that the CNA still uh, was able to gain the elections. Right? If you see the, see the all, all, all the same years, 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 the same the ANC, the ANC was still able to win the elections. Uh, because if you look at you know unemployment, uh, the, the the logic of uh, fatigue of material and, and everything, uh, one would say, well, uh, uh, how is it possible? Uh, uh, it's a clearly a democracy, but of course it has to do with the history, uh, and it has to do with uh, confidence, which is very profound. But I would say, to go to the war of the ANC, uh, it's your last chance, I would guess. And as somebody said. If you, if you don't do it right now, there will be a vacuum, and I don't know who will fill this in, if it will be not a Duterte, a Bolsonaro, or a Trump. <laughs> so the responsibility is enormous. Right? But then I would say the same, but I think about Brazil, about industrial policies, about a, a, a new kind of developmental alliance, which is open, of course, not closed against uh, protectionism, but to pick up some sectors, to have alliances between us, but to be very tough on the financial sector, to make huge campaigns, to, you know, like we did against the debt crisis in the 80s or whatever, you see? And that would be my small answer. Now, on uh, Kate, Katie, yeah? Yeah, yeah, no, no, but there's Katie still. The, 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 well, wait, 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 we are mobilizing. <laughs> We're not just talking. There's huge mobilization. My students are, are, of course, at the first, in the first moment, we were even afraid you know, after the assassination. There are a lot of assassinations uh, going on, and, and, and especially the indigenous uh, uh, leaders, environmental leaders in, in the Amazon. Um, but uh, there is a lot of mobilization. Uh, the problem is, uh, in the case of environment, we were able to be in the forefront. Uh, like 80% of, 75% of the people condemns clearly the problem. On this issue, we won. We mobilized, we mobilized nationally, we mobilized internationally. I think Macron didn't do us a favor, but then, okay. Uh, but on this issue, we clearly put the government in the defensive. Now, on the issue of pension reform, uh, the workers were, was much more difficult. Why? Because part of the pension reform part of the, of the tax reform, that was something that we had to do. As we didn't do it, we identify ourselves with a system which is partly okay and partly isn't okay. And on this issue, Bolsonaro, the right wing, is not alone. They got the support of the center, the liberals, and the media, and everything. And I don't know in South Africa, for sure it's different, but the one thing is terrible in Brazil, that the mainstream media and television, they just don't invite any person, any economist or whatever, to give another opinion on the, on the pension reform. It, it's incredible. The, the left has no news, uh, national uh, newspaper. It has no uh, national television. Uh, and it's they, oh, on the case of, they are with us on the case of the extreme things, against gays, against the environment, these media is with us, but on, against fascism. But, but because in this case, 
we can use this word. But in the case of the pension fund, uh, the pension reform, <laughs> which was just approved, we mobilized, but we were completely isolated. And that's why you can clearly see that some economic interests, they prefer to do, to sacrifice a democracy by doing deals with the Bolsonaro government, uh, uh, to implement this ultra-liberal uh, policies. Uh, so, in, in reality, at this moment, uh, uh, part of the working class, part of the working class, not a part, has lost confidence in the PT, and as was mentioned, when, when she meant, if you lost the confidence of the workers, it's very difficult to regain. It's very difficult. It takes a lot of time to regain. And that makes things very key. So there's still a lot of it now. I don't want to know any more about this. Now, uh, the, the, the upper middle class and, and the whole uh, mo the majority of the capitalist classes, they say, well, uh, I think I'm better off, uh, but I, I, they don't believe anymore in development of Brazil. They don't believe anymore in any uh, national champions uh, because the companies, this is important, yeah, sorry. The companies that did engage with us, they, were, they, they did corruption, but what happened? What do you do if there's corruption? You pick up the guy and put him in jail. What did they do in Brazil? They destroyed the companies. And who's taking their place? American companies, European companies, Chinese companies. So if you're against national champion strategy, they did it. They destroyed it completely. Yeah? But it wasn't in the benefit of the poor. Yeah? It wasn't in the benefit of other groups who came in. And then people said, okay, it will never work again. Yeah? Uh, people, for example, I did interviews with people of, of uh, uh, parts of the shipbuilding. Yeah? They said, well, I did huge investments. I believed in this policy. Now it's destroyed. Never in my life I will invest anymore. I will put my money in the financial sector. So you have to regain this. Yeah. But, but just to... <laughs> we are not at all... Uh, there is a strong mobilization. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I mean... Not as strong as it can be. But this has to do with the fact that we lost... We lost the, the, the communication. Uh, and we lost the confidence of part of the world. But we are still... The, the uh, very strong and alive to democratic forces. The question that will be next uh, is uh, in how far are we willing and able to make deals with other democratic forces who might have some liberal ideas, uh, but we maybe have to, because we are too isolated uh, to have opposition ourselves. That, that's another issue. I don't know if this is clear. Now, on, on the question. So, uh, you say. Can we judge the people's judgment? Well, I confess that I was looking to this and I was thinking and thinking. <laughs> and I, I must confess, I don't know what to say to this. Uh, because if you mean that the judgment, by judgment of the people, that they voted for Bolsonaro, and that we can say, well, um, it, we, we cannot, uh, how to judge this, I mean, what I try to do is to give all the different reasons, which are part of them, they're structural, they're profound, part of them are superficial, part of them are long term, part of them are short term, that explain this judgment of the people. Why did uh, uh, part of the people who, who loved Lula vote for Bolsonaro? Millions. That's difficult, extremely difficult. Yeah. Why would we see suddenly at, at, the, at the, the, the party when, on the streets when Bolsonaro won, we see a lot of Israeli flags? <laughs> you see? And then you start to look at it, what judgment is this? Oh, wait a minute, since 2015, Bolsonaro has invested, he went to, the, to, to Israel, he went to baptize himself, or those Catholics, by Neo Pentecostal in the Jordan River. And he got full support because Israel withdrew as ambassador in 2015. And all the Pentecostal churches and WhatsApp groups, they would say, we didn't see it, we had no clue. 
those who attack uh, Israel will be crushed by God. And so Dilma became the Antichrist because she had a political conflict with Netanyahu. How can I judge this? You see, it's, it's very complex. And so I, I, I think what we never can do as democratic forces, we can never put into question the, uh, let's say, the serenity of the people. I mean, they, they made this judgment at that moment. It doesn't mean that they're fascists. I, I have this, this discussion with my wife, <laughs> the people in my main, main book. It's a name. We have to invite them for our parts. We have to talk to them. So we have to win them again. It's not possible that they're not, they, they're not fascists. They're not. They are fascists, of course. Okay, 5 10 percent. But not 55 percent. You see? To the hardcore Bolsonaro, that's horrible. But there are a lot of people who made the judgment because of all the things I tried to explain. And, and, and it's difficult, of course, to, to, to speak one hour to the Bolsonaro. <laughs> but we have to keep talking. We have to keep talking. Like, like I said, this, you know, this, this, the new Pentecostal church, they are there and they will grow and they are not our enemies. They are not necessarily against democracy, eh? not at all. Eh? But we have to open up a dialogue. I'm sure that COF will be open for further questions and engagement at the cocktail reception, so feel free to approach them there. And on that note, if we hand back to the program director. Fascinating discussion, and we're very pleased that uh, our executive director, and you also have a very long bio, which I won't go into, uh, but um, apart from anything else, things I didn't know, like he, he studied political science at the Institute of Social Science in Moscow, which must have been a very long time ago, Bujo. Um, and, and obviously has been a leader of the Mapungubwe Institute project for the last 10 years or so. So, uh, and he's going to give some closing remarks. Thanks, Joe. And then after that, I think we must just proceed directly to the cocktail. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. My responsibility is merely to wrap up what I think has been a very productive evening for all of us. Uh, I should explain that uh, as Mistra, we invited uh, Professor Romano a shoot. I was going to call him Skete, and I was ad advised that that is, not, that is not correct uh, for many reasons. But to stand out, the first one is about the depth and intensity of his uh, intellectual application. And the second one is the fact that uh, he has had experience in the trade union movement, in government, and in academia. And I think that blend of uh, intellectual acumen and uh, experiential expertise stands him in good state. There are many issues that he raised in the presentation as well as in the response to the questions. And I'll just cite a few that struck me in addition to, 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 to what uh, Professor Tregena raised. Um, the first one is whilst right wing um, forces international ones may intervene to try and influence domestic politics through chauvinistic identities and uh, right-wing religiosity. We cannot use that as an excuse to justify our own ethical misdemeanors because they are taking advantage 
of a fertile situation for them. The second issue for me is that uh, the campaign against corruption cannot be the be all and end all to societal renewal. If we think the NDP and this or the other commission will produce economic growth and inclusivity they want. So in addition to dealing with corruption, you need to address the fundamental socioeconomic issues. And also, as you are saying, improve state capacity to implement progressive programs. The other issue is about uh, finance capital. And in South Africa, we are perhaps very far from addressing that issue. What with even development finance institutions owned by the state operating like commercial banks. Leave alone the, the, the private ones. We are still far from dealing with that question. I was also struck by the observation about uh, President Dilma Rousseff's administration, a question that is profoundly relevant for South Africa today. She was trying to manage a difficult global economic environment. And in the process of doing so, you might be compelled to implement policies that, is, that have got an immediate negative impact on the populace. In South Africa, for instance, in order just to stem the challenge of the budget deficit, we had to introduce VET. How do progressives manage that difficult environment? One can go on and on, but the insights are many, and I take it they are exercising all your mind. And I think you would all agree that uh, we should give yet another round of applause to <laughs> Professor Sketi. The, the discussions will continue in the foyer, but perhaps we should just indicate that in partnership with the HSRC, there will be a discussion in Pretoria tomorrow uh, to take some of these matters forward. I should also take this opportunity to thank uh, the University of Johannesburg uh, for our partnership, which has made this event possible. Uh, definitely Dr. Vukuza and other leaders of the university, the chancellor is here. We do value this relationship and long may it uh, continue. Uh, we should also thank uh, Dr. Abramse and Professor Tregena for their management of the program. Uh, I will, on your behalf, even before you sample this, thank the caterers, <laughs> as well as Yellowwoods and Spire Estate, who have provided the wines, which I think will also help to fire the debate <laughs> uh, as we continue afterwards. Our gratitude also to the MISTRA and UJ uh, task teams for their hard work in preparing for this event. But as always, we should thank you for attending, for participating, and we conclude with the conviction that what we have all learned today will help influence what we do wherever we may be located in order to take South Africa onto a higher growth and development trajectory. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you.